Hi, welcome everyone. My name is Rodrigo Valenzuela. I'm an assistant professor at the School of Art and Architecture at University of California, Los Angeles. We at the Art Department organized these talks, this lecture series, in collaboration with the Hammer Art Museum. I'm really excited to hear Patty Chan's today, and I want to begin by distilling Ip Ochi's comments on Chang's work. Her performance pieces can be the best described as balancing act, not only in the way she manipulates her body, but in her ability to create words that juxtapose absolute stillness with explosive tension, slight humor with incessive revelation. I particularly love how her work can be unromantic and emotionally charged at the same time, especially in video pieces such as The Book of Love 2019, where she uses the flow of translation to address issues of representation and cultural hegemony. Patti Chan is an artist working on performance, video, writing, and installation. She lives and works in Los Angeles. Patti Chan was born in 1972 uh, in San Leandro, California. Chan received her BFA from University of California, San Diego in 1994. Her work had been exhibited nationwide and internationally at such institutions as like MoMA, Guggenheim, and the New Museum in New York, the Park Utrecht in Netherlands, the Hammer Art Museum in Los Angeles, the Fry, Arts, the Fry Center in Switzerland, Chinese Art Center in Manchester, England, the Museum of Contemporary in Chicago, and SF MoMA. Her work received a 2003 award for the Rockefeller Foundation and a 2012 Creative Capital Award. In 2008, she was a finalist for the Hugo Boss Prize and a fellow in the Visual Arts and the, Academy, and the American Academy in Berlin. In 2014, Chang was the fellow, was a Guggenheim Foundation fellow. Her acclaim exhibition, Patty Chang, Wandering Lake, 2009-2017, was most recently viewed at the Institute of Contemporary Art, Los Angeles, in 2019. Please help me to welcome Patty Chang. Thank you so much, Rodrigo. Uh, I'd like to thank Candice Lynn, Andrea Frazier, Kathy Opie, Claudia Bester, and Aaron Kermanikian. Um, so by request, I will talk about my project, The Wandering Lake, uh, which was an eight year project, which took me from Xinjiang, China, to the Aral Sea in Uzbekistan, to Newfoundland, Canada, and back to Eastern China, all to study the movement of natural and human engineered water um, specifically, I will talk about the two parts which I think equally make up this project. The book, which is not a catalog, but an artist book, published by Dancing Foxes Press. It combines writing and travel photos with historic and theoretical texts, excerpts, as well as photographs of sculptures and watercolors. It is a personal, associative, narrative meditation on mourning, caregiving, and landscape. And the physical exhibition curated by Hitomi Iwasaki and presented at the Queens Museum um, and with Jamila James at the ICA LA, it is a manifestation of the project that tries to create an experience of embodied relationship between geography, history, cultural mythology, affective states, and environmental and personal loss. This is about the process of making a work and the process of experiencing a work and thinking about that impossible gap in between. The project started in 2009 when I picked up the book, The Wandering Lake by Sven Heden, a Swedish colonial explorer working during the great, great, the great game, the rivalry between Great Britain and Russia to dominate the world through dominating and mapping Central Asia. He was commissioned by the Chinese government to find a route along the Silk Road accessible by car between China and Europe for trade purposes. He was personally interested in mapping what he termed the wandering lake, Lake Lop Noor, which moved positions in the Chinese desert, getting lost and re-emerging elsewhere, mismapped by explorers of the time. It must be pointed out that the water was always there moving in one form or another, even if overlooked.
From looking at the Wandering Lake in Xinjiang province in China, I went to the Aral Sea in Uzbekistan and then to the longest aqueduct in the world in Eastern China, bringing water from the South to the Northern capital of Beijing. And during this long eight year process, my child was born and my father died. These events became embedded within the experience of the work. Personal joys and loss sit in relation to environmental and societal joy and loss. This project lived on my laptop and various hard drives from 2009 until 2016, when I decided to make the project into a physical installation. For most of the process, the project was loosely gathered information, reflections, performances documented in photographs and video, digital files of readings, and found images and diagrams, all accumulating over time. Sometimes I would give talks about parts of the project, pairing language with images and video. Um, I did not know how it would manifest as a physical experience beyond the complex ways stories develop through accumulation. First, I'd like to read a passage from the beginning quarter of the book. A few days before I arrived in Fogo, a dead sperm whale washed up onto the shore. Its head was lodged in some rocks, but its body floated freely with the waves. The entire first week I was there, at the end of June, the weather was really bad, rain and wind every day. On the first clear day, I wanted to walk across the island. We lived in the middle, and I walked 11 miles to one end, where I decided to wash the dead whale. It was about 30 feet long and probably a young male. The experience of being in the water with this animal was very different from seeing it from the top of the rocks. I had never been in the water with such a large dead being before. In fact, I'd never seen anything so large and dead before. My sense of mortality was overwhelming. It was a sense of sorrow and indescribable emptiness. Washing a deceased body is a practice thought to purify and prepare it for the next stage. This ablution occurs in many religions, Judaism and Hinduism, for example. It is a way of caring and connecting and at the same time letting go. The daily ritual of cleaning allows for mourning and honoring in our everyday life. The island of Newfoundland is situated at the easternmost point of North America. Neighboring Fogo Island is an old fishing island. Since the 1992 Canadian moratorium on cod, people do not fish there anymore for money. The lack of industry recently prompted the formation of an art residency, which was hoped to generate art tourism. The idea was that one can lead with the arts and economy will follow. The location of the residency is interesting. If you've ever read Mark Kurlansky's Cod, a biography from 1997, you'll know that the waters off Newfoundland are where the Basque came to fish for cod in the 1400s. They kept this fishing grounds secret, fearing others would follow, but the new world would not be secret for long. Moby Dick was written at the tail end of the whaling industry in the mid 1800s, not many years before the discovery of oil. Moby Dick is often seen as an allegory of American expansion and of colonization fueled by whaling industry wealth. 
Perhaps this melancholy connects with a feeling of the end of empire, a mourning of times past. From the chapter, The Fountain, in Herman Melville's Moby Dick, 1851. Let us then look at this matter along with some interesting items contingent. Everyone knows that by the peculiar cunning of their gills, the finny tribe in general breathe the air which at all times is combined with the element in which they swim. Hence, a herring or a cod might live a century and never once raise its head above the surface. But owing to his marked internal structure, which gives him regular lungs, like a human being's, the whale can only live by inhaling the disengaged air in the open atmosphere, wherefore the necessity for his periodical visits to the upper world. But he cannot in any degree breathe through his mouth, for in his ordinary attitude, the sperm whale's mouth is buried at least eight feet beneath the surface. And what is still more, his windpipe has no connection with his mouth. No, he breathes through his spiracle alone, and this is on the top of his head. If I say that in any creature, breathing is only a function indispensable to vitality, inasmuch as it withdraws from the air a certain element, which being subsequently brought into contact with the blood imparts to the blood its vivifying principle, I do not think I shall err, though I may possibly use some superfluous scientific words. Assume it and it follows that if all the blood in a man could be aerated with one breath, he might then seal up his nostrils and not fetch another for a considerable time. That is to say, he would then live without breathing. Until it is over, you can be unaware of what stage you are at in the grieving process. In New York, after September 11th, I was unsure about what to do with myself creatively. I had just mounted an exhibition. I felt frozen, disconnected, and anxious. At the time, it seemed normal to have anxiety and reoccurring dreams about planes. During this period, I sifted through snapshots of friends and family and began making watercolors of them as a way to make images with water and to spend time thinking about the people in my life. My mourning took the form of reinforcing relationships and spending time with people I cared about by sifting through photos, choosing photos and watercoloring them. It was a pleasure to spend time looking at these pictures and recreating them was an excuse to indulge in an activity that filled me with joy and comfort as a child. After I was finished, I gave the watercolors to the people in them. It seemed selfish and personal, and I am a little embarrassed by my sentimental impulse. Thinking about where the watercolors might have ended up, hung on the wall, kept in storage, lost or stolen, compelled me to contact some of the people I had made drawings for to ask them to document what they had done with them. I arrived in the capital of Uzbekistan, Tashkent, after more than 24 hours of travel through Frankfurt and Astana, waiting overnight at the airport in Almaty with many other people, paying way too much for a nest tea. There was a program on TV of Russian dancers on a variety show, just like the Saturday Night Live sketch of Fred Armisen sambaying. Flights landed and took off all night. The sun rose so slowly that I barely made it off the ground at 8 a.m. There was so much haze during takeoff. Many factories surrounded the city. 
Before my translator, Kamola and I went to buy our plane tickets for Nukus, the city closest to the Oral Sea and the largest city in Western Uzbekistan, we needed to change money. She brought me to see an old Korean guy hanging out on the sidewalk outside the Moskva liquor store. Moskva was accented with little top hats dancing above its letters. We gave him $500 for a bag of money larger than a shoebox. 1,380,000 som. It felt strange to need such a big bag to carry cash. Exhausted by the day, I ate eggs benedict and carrot soup and bought apples at the bazaar. Smells I noticed, petrol from the cars, fried foods. Even in the street where restaurants are not apparent, there were odors of bodies and interiors. The bazaar smells of spice and cooking oil, extraordinary dusty street smells. The only reading I brought with me was Mother Reader, Essential Writings on Motherhood, 2001, edited by Moira Davey, and Salman Rushdie's Midnight's Children, 1981, about partition and the birth and mix up of fraternal twins at the stroke of midnight on the day of the birth of Pakistan. Blueberry and peach, passion fruit down in yogurt, Coke, peach nectar, pomegranate juice, black bread, cheese spread, tomatoes, cucumbers, mandarin oranges. The following day was hard. I woke up at 5 a.m. to catch a plane to Nukus. The plane had a propeller and was extremely old. While waiting at the gate at the brand new airport, I saw a guy being sent through the security gate on a gurney. He had a floral blanket covering him and the guards kept checking under the blanket. The smell of people in the airport was intense, mostly men, some women and children. Kamola says the smell of people is of unwashed bodies and the food they eat. She says the Uzbeks have a distinct smell, body oil and unwashed clothes. I made the mistake of eating two apples when I woke up, then an orange at the airport. The ride was extremely turbulent. Almost immediately, I got nauseous. I proceeded to get violently sick twice in the toilet, as if I had too many margaritas on a bender. It was sour like limes and tequila, and brutal to the point of dry heaving post vial. My aim wasn't so good due to the turbulence. From Heidi Murkoff and Sharon Mizell's What to Expect When You're Expecting, fourth edition, 2008. Week nine, your baby, who has officially graduated now from embryo to fetus, has grown to approximately one inch in length, about the size of a medium green olive. His or her head is continuing to develop and take on more baby-like proportions. This week, tiny muscles are starting to form. This will allow your fetus to move his or her arms and legs though it'll be at least another month before you'll be able to feel those little punches and kicks. While it's way too early to feel anything, it's not too early to hear something, possibly. The glorious sound of your baby's heartbeat might be audible via a Doppler device in your practitioner's office. Take a listen. It's sure to make your heart beat a little faster. Nukus felt to me like a small rural town in Western China. Perhaps that was my closest frame of reference because Xinjiang is also predominantly Muslim. It is extremely flat. There was a film studio near the hotel and I was curious about what they did there. We went to a small restaurant called S. It was musty and smelled strongly of gamey meat, like it had never been cleaned. The tables were in private booths partitioned by fabric. I got a bowl of borscht and a plate of fried eggs and a Coca-Cola. The eggs were a bad idea. Anything fried in oil is a bad idea. We tried to go to a small stadium for the yearly Navruz celebrations, but were denied because we were foreign. They knew that Kamola was from the city. I had to sleep again till evening. Intense nausea. From Natalia Antalava's Forced Sterilization of Women in Uzbekistan, 2013. During his annual address two years ago, 
President Karimov designated 2012 as the year of the family and said, everyone is aware of how much effort and funds have been put toward the protection of motherhood and childhood, including the construction in the capital city and the regions of diagnostic screening and perinatal centers and new maternity complexes supplied with modern medical equipment. In all the regions of the country, practically the entire population is provided with medical examinations and ultrasound checkups at countryside medical stations and specialized centers supplied with modern equipment. It is hard to find analogies to preventative measures being adopted in Uzbekistan that protect the population's reproductive health by strengthening the health of pregnant women. According to a number of respected international institutions, Uzbekistan occupies one of the leading places among 125 countries of the world on the level of favorable conditions created for women and protection of motherhood. The UNICEF Regional Office for Eastern Europe, Baltics and CIS recognized Uzbekistan to be the regional model on introducing programs in the area of protection of motherhood and childhood. In the town of Moynak, Uzbekistan, sits the Museum of Local Lore. Housed in the municipal building or across the hall, you can apply for a marriage certificate. The museum is open by appointment only. According to their website, quote, the main reason for a visit to Moynak is to witness the death throes of the Ural Sea and the dramatic sight of dozens of deserted fishing boats resting at their moorings, submerged in sand, or riding the crest of a sand dune. By contrast, the museum is a humble display of local animal pelts, painted shorelines, and canned fish stacked in pyramids. The Aral Sea was once the fourth largest inland sea in the world. It has lost over 80% of its water thanks to large scale Soviet irrigation projects. In the 1960s, the Soviet Union successfully turned the dry lands of Central Asia into a giant cotton plantation by creating thousands of miles of canals, dams, and reservoirs in five Central Asian republics to irrigate the croplands. This shifting of the paths of water destined for the Aral Sea was initiated with the knowledge that the sea would likely disappear. We went to Moynak by taxi. Before we left Nukus, I bought some Russian crackers and peach and pomegranate juice from a shop. Almost three hours out of the city, we passed a cotton storage facility. You cannot take pictures of it. Much of the highway was under construction and we drove on a dirt path parallel to the road. We arrived in Moynak just as the Nevruz celebration was starting. We took our cameras saying we were simply filming the festival. They had photo sessions photo station set up, one of cherry or apricot blossoms in front of telephone poles. The photographer was on crutches. From Heidi Murkoff and Sharon Mizell's, what do you expect when you're expecting fourth edition 2008? Fatigue, lack of energy, sleepiness, frequent urination, nausea, with or without vomiting, excessive saliva, constipation, heartburn, indigestion, flatulence, bloating, food aversions and cravings, breast changes, fullness, heaviness, tenderness, tingling, darkening of the areolas, lubrication glands in the areolas becoming prominent like large goosebumps, expanding network of bluish lines under your skin, visible veins on your abdomen, legs and elsewhere as your blood supply pumps up, slight increase in vaginal discharge, occasional headaches, occasional faintness or dizziness, a little more rounding of your belly, your clothes feeling a little snugger. I interviewed Kamola's grandmother and uncle who live in Kunigrat, 
one and a half hours from Moynak. She worked in the cotton industry for 45 years and grew fruit and vegetables on the side. In 1977, they bought a car and started going to Moynak to sell them. Moynak was once the largest port on the Aral Sea with fishermen and a canning industry. Everyone was too busy fishing to grow vegetables. Kamola's grandmother grew carrots, potatoes, apricot trees, melons, and tomatoes and cucumbers after the Koreans came. They don't allow you to take photos of anything man-made, industrial, the gas station, bridge, or cotton facility. Everyone knows the rules. So I started thinking I cannot work here because it's too controlled. Since the sea shrank and receded, Moynak is in the middle of a desert. The tens, the thousands of miles of pipelines and canals that irrigate water away from the Aral Sea are proof that the sea still retains its power and volume. It was just circling and weaving and lacing the landscape in intricate patterns, probably not visible from space, but possibly from an airplane. Human innovation had misguided the water into holding patterns of absent-mindedness. But if it is true what they say, that water has a perfect memory and always returns to where it came from, then the invocations will certainly call them back home. Invocation of loss of balance. Invocation of falling. Invocation of motor control. Invocation of envy. Invocation of incontinence. Invocation of caregiving. Invocation of catheter. Invocation of daily life. Invocation of isolation. Invocation of shame. Invocation of guilt. Invocation of longing. Invocation of fainting. Invocation of restless skies. Invocation of a fracture. Invocation of humiliation. Invocation of a shadow. Invocation of inappropriate laughing or crying. Invocation of medical directive. Invocation of wandering lake. Invocation of end of life care. Invocation of writing with light. Invocation of evaporation. Invocation of bureaucratic waste. Invocation of double helix. Invocation of dementia. Invocation of grief. Invocation of artificial respiration. Invocation of feeding tube. Invocation of dry baths. Invocation of vocal cord paralysis. Invocation of morphine suppositories. Invocation of noise reducing headphones. Invocation of silence. Invocation of slurry, croaky voice. Invocation of gasping. I interviewed Kamola's grandmother again. I asked her to draw a map of where she used to sell vegetables in Moynak. I wondered how I might work in this place without filming 
and imagine throwing dust and shooting that because it is nothing and it disappears immediately. I knew I shouldn't give up so easily, but it took me time to adjust to the environment. It wasn't as comfortable as I'm used to, and I wasn't sure if it was the pregnancy or morning sickness, or if when I traveled before, it was also uncomfortable and I just didn't remember. Then I remembered my trip to Shangri-La in rural China, where I lived in an unheated Tibetan house with only a public pit toilet for three months. From the future, it didn't seem so bad. From Heidi Murkoff and Sharon Mizell's what to expect when you're expecting fourth edition 2008. Emotional ups and downs, like amped up PMS, which may include mood swings, irritability, irrationality, inexplic inexplicable weepiness, misgivings, fear, joy, elation, any or all of these. A sense of unreality about the pregnancy. Is there really a baby in there? Timur told us about the last Russian in Moynak, who got a grant to take soil from the Sudaria River and plant trees in the city because it has become a desert climate. 11 Russian families apparently still live in Moynak. The last Russian from Moynak is named Vladimir. He agreed to meet with us. He said to come to his home, which has four trees planted outside and a blue gate. I went back to Nukus on a French plane, not a Russian. SpongeBob was on the TV at the hotel. He was directing boats on wheels through an intersection because he was wearing a uniform. Heidi Murkoff and Sharon Mizell, what to expect when you're expecting fourth edition 2008. Week 10, at nearly one and a half inches long, about the size of a prune, your baby is growing by leaps and bounds. And in gearing up for those first leaps and bounds and baby steps, bones and cartilage are forming and small indentations on the legs are developing into knees and ankles. Even more unbelievably for someone the size of a prune, the elbows on baby's arms are already working. Tiny buds of baby teeth are already forming under the gums. Moynak is not in bloom this time of year Vladimir has many cats that come in and out of the garden, which he said overflows in summer. He also has a swimming pool and a sauna in his yard. He used to be a pilot and flew many flights a day to Tashkent, but now there is no airport. His house is entirely covered in fabrics and carpets. I had been terribly nauseous during the car ride with Nukus, and when I got to his house, the food he offered us smelled so strong. I had trouble concentrating and didn't remember what I wanted to ask him and he didn't want to be videotaped. We had tea with sour cherry jam. I could barely stomach it, but didn't want to be rude. So I ate a little. The black tea was salty, like all the tea in the area. The water from the earth is salty, affecting the taste of the food and drink. The groundwater seeped up salty in Congrat after the Aral Sea disappeared. Moynak's canneries were so busy during World War II that the Soviet government sent Russians to work in them, packing fish for the soldiers on the front lines. People worked nonstop to send food to the military. Vladimir remembered a film made on the streets of Moynak called The Fishermen of the Aral Sea. It was a Russian movie with local actors. He lent me two buckets of water so that I could film the washing on the Aral seabed. I heard a news report on public radio about a secret sterilization program the government of Uzbekistan had been conducting on women in the country. Some women didn't even know they were sterilized until they went to the doctor because they couldn't get pregnant. To limit the number of babies born, some women were automatically sterilized when they had a C-section. Sometimes they were told they could reverse the procedure when they were ready to get pregnant again. From Alice Walker's One Child of One's Own, a meaningful digression within the works, 1979, in Mother Reader, Essential Writings on Motherhood, edited by Maura Davy, 2001. Quote, for those of us who both love and fear the child because of the work we do, who would 
be lovers only if we could, I propose and defend a plan of life that encourages one child of one's own, which I consider a meaningful, some might say necessary, digression within the works. It is perfectly true that I, like many other women who work, especially as writers, were terrified of having children. I feared being fractured by the experience, if not overwhelmed. I thought the quality of my writing would be considerably diminished by motherhood, that nothing that was good for my writing could come out of having children. My first mistake was in thinking children instead of child. My second was in seeing the child as my enemy rather than the racism and sexism of an oppressive capitalist society. My third was in believing none of the benefits of having a child would accrue in my writing. Someone asked me once whether I thought women artists should have children. I gave my answer promptly. Yes, I said, somewhat to my surprise. As if to amend my rashness, I added, they should have children, assuming this is of interest to them, but only one. Why only one, this someone wanted to know. Because with one, you can move, I said. With more than one, you're a sitting duck. I went back to Uzbekistan two years later. I wanted to return so I could try again to go to the very edge of the Aral Sea, since it was impossible on my first trip because the land was frozen. The second time around, we flew from New York to Almaty to Tashkent, then to Nukus, before taking a taxi to Moynak. From there, we hired a driver to drive five hours over the dry seabed to the water's edge. I was weaning my son Leroy and decided that I would continue to pump breast milk during this trip. I would usually pump it while we were sitting for a meal. Afterward, I would dump the milk into any available receptacle and take a snapshot. Uzbekistan is a police state. These photos kind of stood in for my inability to represent and were also a sympathetic loss of flow. From Jill Cassid's epilogue, Landscape in, around, and under the performative, 2011. Thesis one, landscape is. This form of the simple present is and is not an illusion. Landscape's appearance of mere being, its isness does not make landscape a simple thing. For landscape to be, for it to function as ground, setting, locus, or environment, it must take place. Landscape isness should thus be understood as an effect of what landscape does. Its intransitive action resides in this transit between verb and noun. Landscape's intransitive simple present performs the action of creating the seemingly unchanging effect of an eternal continuous present, an immutable or even sufficient ground for action or claim. Landscape's isness does not just make up the setting, stage, space, or frame of the performative, but supplies its very condition The illusion of isness is so strong that one of the most powerful and resilient effects of landscape is this impression of simple being in an eternal and immutable present that has not and can never be otherwise, an effect otherwise known as naturalization. With so much information and documentation accumulated over a long period, the question was how to organize it so it made sense without the narrative and language. Material and scale become a way to understand the project and simplify through this relationship to space. Upon entering the show, 
this is at the Queen's Museum, the first thing you see is Invocation for a Wandering Lake, parts one and two. The videos of the washing of the boat in Uzbekistan and the washing of the whale in Newfoundland projected onto bifolded cardboard panels. These are the largest images in the show. They are landscape scaled, horizontal, cinematic frames. The scale is broken up by the vertical bifolded cardboard. When you move around the forms, they cut and fracture the image. The image is constantly changing depending on your position. The scale of the installation is in direct relation to the body moving through it. One becomes aware of one's movements as being integral to the experience of the work. This work is an act of mourning. After the video installation is let down, a photo installation with images taken from Uzbekistan of the desert landscape, irrigation systems, and the desert that was formerly the Aral seabed. The form is architectural and scaled for human passage. The panels are constructed of plywood with photos posted on some panels placed in a way that creates a sort of maze. There is no set path and the images around corners lead you from one image to the next. The body editing the images as you move through. Along with images of the desert, the seabed, irrigation, which are large in scale, are smaller images of the discredited breast milk tossed in bowls, cups. There's only one photo uh, in the installation that is not from Uzbekistan and that is of a lactation fountain um, found in Amalfi, Italy, which was a popular type of fountain during the Belle Epoque. Writes Astrida Neimanis, quote, we are bodies of water. We are not on the one hand embodied while on the other hand, primarily comprising water. We are both of these things inextricably and at once made mostly of wet matter, but also a swim in the discursive flocculations of embodiment as an idea. We live at the site of exponential material meaning where embodiment meets water. Given the various interconnected and anthropogenically exacerbated water crises that our planet currently faces, from drought and freshwater shortages to wild weather, floods, and chronic contamination. This meaningful mattering of our bodies is also an urgent question of worldly survival. And the interstitial, interstitial space after letdown is a two channel video of um, the list of invocations read by my mother on the right and a video of me singing to my dad when he was in hospice on the left. I learned from hospice that hearing is the last sense to go so that I should talk or sing so he knows he's not alone or that he is still here. In vocation of loss of ba balance. In vocation of a foul. In vocation of motor control. In vocation of envy. In location of the care giving. In location of capital. In location of daily life. In location of isolation. In location of shame. Invocation of guilt, 
in location of long in location of fantasy in location of restless skies in location of adventure in vocation of humiliation, in vocation of a shadow, in vocation of inappropriate laughing or crying, in vocation of medical directive, in vocation of wandering lake. Now I in vocation of end of life own. care, in vocation of writing with a light, in vocation of evaporation, in vocation of bureaucratic waste, in vocation of double helix, in vocation of Dementia, invocation of grief, invocation of artificial respiration, invocation of feeding sheep, invocation of dry bath, invocation of vocal cord paralysis, invocation of morphia. Will I be rich? Supposition. Here's what she Talk. said to me. In vocation of noise reducing happiness. In vocation of the silence. In vocation of slurry croaky words. In vocation of gasping. This hallway leads to the next gallery, which has the project configurations where I followed along the longest aqueduct in the world in China. As a ritual, every time I came upon it, I would urinate using a feminine urinary device because somehow I imagined moving as I was peeing paralleling controlled and uncontrollable flow on the scale of infrastructures in relation to the human body. When I came back, I designed urinary devices out of plastic water and drink bottles and had them blown in borosilicate glass, um, which is scientific glass, by Amy Lemaire. The urinary devices directly relate to the scale of the body the bottles were hung at hip height on the wall and were displayed on long tables, one object at a time. I often get emotional reactions in response to this project, The Wandering Lake. People tell me that they are moved to tears. I do include emotional information about my family, but I also wonder if the project has been used as a space or experience of emotional outlet in response to the changing climate or changing environment. There are often few opportunities for emotions of sadness, grief, mourning, loss in relation to our shared environment with the thought perhaps that the earth or its component parts are not groovable bodies. As Judith Butler writes, quote, some lives are grievable and others are not. Ashley Consola Willux extends this to the non-human, quote, as though animal, vegetal, and mineral bodies are somewhat constituted to be ungrievable. She writes, quote, what if we are expected not to mourn? What if we are asked to publicly shelve or bracket our mourning for something or someone or somewhere as we have been asked to do with the impacts of climate change. What do we do when what could be mourned is stripped of its capacity to count as a grievable body in public discourse? In the last room, there's a series of vitrines with objects, photos, 
text from the project relating to accumulation of information loosely held together and the book format. Each didactic is not directly describing the object, but tells a part of the story. The experience of the vitrine is important in its closeness to us as viewers. We bend over it and look closely and read to ourselves, which creates an intimate and internalized experience. From the scale of landscape in the whale and the boat to the body and letdown in the glass urinary devices, the project ends with intimacy and internalization. The project bridges this large scale of the environment with the intimate scale of self, holding multiple scales at any moment. Sandra Steingreiber in Having Faith, An Ecologist's Journey to Motherhood, realizes that in pregnancy, she has become, quote, she has, quote, become a habitat. There is a need to protect the interior as well as exterior habitats because they're linked. Regarding amniotic fluid, she writes, quote, I drink water and it becomes blood plasma, which suffuses through the amniotic sac and surrounds the baby who also drinks it. And what is it before that? Before it is drinking water, amniotic fluid is the creeks and rivers that fill reservoirs. It is the underground water that fills wells. And before it is creeks and rivers and groundwater. Amniotic fluid is rain. Whatever is inside hummingbird eggs is also inside my womb. Whatever is in the world's water is here in my hands. Thank you. Um, so I will, I can take some questions um, from the audience. Um, oh, and um, you can put your questions in the uh, live stream chat box. And um, if you're in full screen, you have to exit that first in order to access the chat, which is, uh, you know, at the very bottom. And so you just um, exit, exit and then click on chat and then you can add your questions. Um, so <clears throat> let's see. Mm. Patty, I really love the way that you incorporated a lyrical meditation on motherhood into your practice and this lecture. How has your relationship to motherhood shifted as your child gets older? How has this affected your practice? Hmm. Well, um, obviously right now that we're in um, the pandemic, um, parenting has become 24 seven. And so there's not a lot of time for other space. And I, I think that starting when, from when he was younger and when I was working on this project, um, I mean, there was really a shift in my practice in terms of the amount of time that I had at any one moment to work on a project. Um, I think there was a real fracturing of uh, the work um, in, and how I had to sort of move to spurts. Um, and, and maybe, you know, like that's part of why it sort of got folded into this project um, as well as, uh, you know, pulling from all these different sources too, I think um, is part of that. Um, in terms of how um, my relationship to mother has shifted as my child gets older, 
I mean, I guess um, I'm wondering if that's in terms of my practice or just in thinking about motherhood, um, just off the top of my head, you know, thinking about like when he was younger, for instance, when I was working on this project, um, I could kind of imagine all these different scenarios. Um, and, you know, he's physically there, but, you know, doesn't talk back or doesn't um, respond. Whereas now, you know, he's eight and then there is, you know, there's much more about this conversation or negotiation that happens. Um, and, um, I mean, I guess, you know, just to bring it to, back to this particular time um, that caregiving is, you know, really a full-time job. And so um, I guess, you know, thinking about, I mean, that has become, you know, part of the, part of the practice as well. You know, I just um, finished this project called Milk Debt, um, which is a, a multiple channel video project um, where women, um, are pumping breast milk while they read lists of um, other people's fears. And, um, and so, you know, like thinking about holding fear as well as, um, uh, you know, holding care at the same time, like going back and forth, um, I think, you know, is sort of a continuation of thinking about motherhood and, um, and caregiving and, and having, you know, like all of these sides at once and the sort of complexity of those feelings. Um, uh, so the second question is, um, Jennifer asks, why were they so opposed to filming everywhere you went? Um, and I'm assuming this is all uh, in Uzbekistan. Um, at the time, um, Uzbekistan um, uh, was an authoritarian state and um, they just didn't allow you to film certain things, a lot of infrastructure, um, you know, things like bridges, um, certain factories. Well, I think all, maybe all factories, gas stations and, um, uh, and everybody knew that um, from, you know, like um, my translator to the driver to just people, you know, like they would just say, well, you, you can't, you know, film these things. Um, and, um, and that was just understood to be that way. Um, let's see, the next question. What part of the fear of motherhood became true and what part of it was just the fear itself? Um, maybe, so maybe this question is about what I just said about this project Milk Debt that I had just finished. Um, what part of the fear of motherhood became true and what part of it was just the fear itself? Um, I mean, after having like sort of accumulated all these fears from different people and um, from, you know, fears like climate change and, um, uh, you know, uh, the end of democracy to humiliation um, uh, or things that are maybe more interior. Um, it sort of made me think about how we can think about some fears as being irrational and some fears as, as being rational. Um, and it makes me think about how, you know, why um, you know, why some fears are considered that way and why others are not. Um, and, you know, in some ways how that they are all real. Um, and perhaps, you know, some part of that is also a gendered, um, a gender issue, you know, especially in terms of thinking about, um, uh, psychology and hysteria. Um, uh, but, you know, having the, these, exterior or, you know, like grand scaled fears next to very personal and small fears um, and how they move back and forth, um, uh, you know, really made me think about uh, considering fear um, on the same plane, you know, sort of like trying to consider them all at, you know, one baseline, starting from one baseline. Um, 
and, and what happens, you know, thinking about the in, our interiors and exteriors when we do that, you know, like um, that's something, you know, like feeling humiliation or, you know, um, uh, some other fear that, you know, is might be considered silly um, would be seen next to, you know, like um, the loss of democracy. Um, Paul, Paula, the urinary devices are also phallic. Are you mimicking, mocking the patriarchal impulse that brought us the whaling industry and the rerouting of the lake? Um, sure, yeah. I mean, um, I think that uh, some of them are phallic, some of them are, um, I think I showed one that was like the Coke bottle. So, you know, like you would squat into that and it wouldn't splash back. So I think there are all different um, ways to use them. Um, but I, you know, from, moving along the aqueduct, I was really struck by, you know, wanting to move and pee at the same time and how, um, how different it makes you feel, you know, like, um, because um, as a, a, a woman, you know, I, I normally pee sitting down. And so, you know, being able to walk around and just urinate anywhere while standing up, while walking, there is a certain empowerment in that. And I think that, you know, um, I think that using the bottles sort of was meant to like recreate that experience. Um, but also, you know, there were some practical issues as well. Like when you're standing, you don't want the pee to like splash down on you. So it's an extension. It is, you know, further from your body. Um, therefore, like the scale of the bottles would be, you know, shorter or longer. Um, but I also do think that in, um, paralleling urinating along the aqueduct and the actual aqueduct itself. Um, for instance, you know, thinking about this idea of flow, but also um, large um, geoengineering pro projects um, and, you know, the, um, the, the desire to um, to colonize, um, whether it be uh, other cultures or the earth, that you know there is this you know impulse that um, uh, I do think um, does some somewhat extend from the patriarchal impulse that you're speaking about. Um, Natsuko asks, I am wondering why you have chosen to showcase your project as an art exhibition rather than creating a movie with actors to communicate a simple message with a script? Um, I think that, I mean, I've made movies in the past with actors and they're, you know, pretty complex, I think as well. Um, but for this particular project, physical embodiment and the experience by an audience member of a physically embodied experience uh, was really important um, in that I think that I wanted to somehow relate the body um, and you know one's sort of consciousness in relation to the body and an experience um, um, with an exterior. Um, also, you know, a lot of the project um, entailed some sort of traveling, like it happens in, in multiple geographical areas. Um, and, you know, like I was saying in terms of the form of the book and the form of a physical installation, the difference was um, in how to kind of relate the experience of the, the information that's delivered in language in the book with images to um, an audience um, in a physical environment that you know, didn't necessarily have to do with narrative. Um, and so I felt like a physical um, relationship to space was really important, like how one moves through space and to be very aware of the body moving through space. You know, like in, in the part where I'm talking about morning sickness and, you know, thinking about researching through the body um, and, you know, that when we go to research, it's not 
just um, an intellectual pursuit, but it also is accompanied by, you know, this whole vessel that's, that's doing the research and, and, you know, what that entails and what that means in relation to, um, I guess, you know, like a street and Imanis talking about bodies of water and, you know, as human bodies or bodies of water in relation to others as well, um, um, as geography. Um, So uh, the invocations were very moving. I felt as they progressed, they were moving me closer and closer to the reality of your father's decline and death. Did you intend a narrative movement? Okay, so I'm going to read that as the script in the invocations video, like as, as the script goes from the beginning of the video to the end of the video that it's um closer to a decline or a death um yeah that was that was part of it um i um that video was sort of thinking about medicalized a medicalized death um you know not only thinking about um human medicalized death but also thinking about um the the land and geography. Um, in the video, yeah, the script does, you know, it ends with gasping, silence, slurry, croaky voice, you know, all of the sort of implements that are used to either prolong human life or, you know, to ease it um, in hospice or, you know, like the sort of things that, um, that are needed um, to soften uh, the, the coming death. And um, so I was thinking about that and as well as, for instance, you know, like in the project, which I didn't show here, um, but I, I talked about very briefly um, the part of the project that's about the aqueduct and thinking about, you know, like the structure of the aqueduct um, or something like the LA River um, that's cemented, you know, that's a, somewhat like a form of life support because it is um, removing it from the, it's, um, it's, I, I wanna say natural state, but I think also it's removing it from an ecosystem of other living and non-living beings um, and, and kind of elevating it and sustaining it um, for a certain purpose, which is to get the waters movement. Um, so thinking about, you know, those th two things in relation to the invocations video. Let's see. Um, so you touched on this, but I'm curious to hear more about the process of spatializing Wandering Lake into the physical exhibition that it became and how complex that distillation must have been. Um, yeah, it was really quite difficult because, um, you know, I had all this stuff and um, I was at the same time trying to put the book together. Um, and so narratively, I had help from um, the editors of Dancing Foxes Press, Robert and Karen, about structures of narrative and voice. Um, if you, I don't know if you noticed because the pages I only showed for a second um, at the, in the very beginning, um, there's the, the layout of the text on the page um, shifted um, throughout the pages. And um, like the type of font, the italicization, the location on the page, um, and that had to do a lot with um, the different voices that um, were used within the text. And that was like an organizing feature. Like it's all this stuff coming from different places. How can it become more clear to a reader? Um, and um, so that was the structure that kind of held, like formally held it together. And so when it came to thinking about the installation, I think also uh, I was considering it just spatially to simplify it, you know, like, because, you know, I had some of the projects, I mean, obviously had made them like the videos of the boat and the whale, but I didn't know how they should be presented and in relation to which pieces um, or even to each other. And um, so I think that, the, the first thing that made it clear, like what could be an organizing principle 
was um, shifting the video installation to be the very first thing that you saw in the show um, because it kind of made it clear, um, I think, that there was um, a relation of scale. And I, I thought that, you know, if that's the first thing that you see and you're kind of struck by it visually, you know, scale wise, um, then you have something to move off of, like to, uh, it, it kind of becomes, you know, um, the starting point. And so, um, so, so having figured out that that should be the first thing that's in the show, um, I worked with um, Hitomi at Queens Museum. Um, then it became easier to decide like, you know, moving from large to small, like starting at landscape, you know, starting the, the experience off as, um, um, as, as, you know, cinematic in scale or something larger than the human body. And, um, and then to move it, you know, closer to architecture, human size and um, human scale and, and then sort of a more intimate, um, intimate scale. Um, so from X, um, thank you for a lovely talk. Could you elaborate on the relationship between bodies and water? How did your relationship to your own body inform your understanding of landscape and climate? Um, I just mentioned um, Astrid and Neyman is talking about bodies and water. Um, so that's one thing. Um, how did your relationship to your own body inform your understanding of landscape and climate? Um, I mean, I think that's multi-part. Um, it's a multi-part um, question because there's like a few different things that I could say. Um, I guess the first thing would be that um, a lot of my earlier work that I made, um, I uh, used my own body and um, and I think that, you know, like it was definitely a process to thinking about um, bodies as in some way um, um, being impacted and also about um, land being something that's impacted. And I think that it, it was a process to sort of, you know, like over time, I mean, over a long period of time um, of like um, coming out of my own body and then being able to relate to bodies outside of myself. Um, and the other thing too is, um, you know, the last quote that I um, had in the talk by um, Sandra Steingraber um, about water entering the body, water being in the body and then water being outside the body and how they're all the same or they've all moved from one place to another um, was also, you know, it had something to do also with having a child and um, um, being pregnant and having a child. And, um, you know, they, they say that when you give birth and then when you, you know, lactate, it's because of certain um, chemical process of hormones that's happening in your body. And part of those hormones is also so that you will take care of the child. Um, so part of that has to do with love, but also, um, and I don't know, I feel like this must be hormonal about, you know, the chemicals in your body so that you take care of the child through love um, and care, but also through fear, like being afraid or cautious or hyper vigilant about everything. Um, and so, you know, like, thinking about the climate was also one of those key points for me. Um, and um, so I think that, you know, part of it was through my body, like having, um, having, uh, uh, having had the child and having had those chemical 
chemically induced feelings, um, as well as um, uh, uh, you know, like um, uh, you know, feeling that um, that I needed to do something about it. Um, the washing of, oh, so this is from Paula. The washing of the whale's body was incredibly powerful. Would love to see the exhibit. <laughs> is it going to be shown at the Hammer? It showed at the ICA LA last year, I think. Um, is that right? In Queens Museum, it was 2017 to 2018. And yeah, in 2019, it showed at the ICA LA. Um, the washing of the whale piece is showing right now at the White Rabbit collection in Sydney, Australia. I don't know where you are, but if you're there, you could go see it there. Um, I don't know if it's gonna show anytime soon again around here. Um, so Natsuko asks, I was really drawn to this performance. I understand that it's about the process. I also feel the frustration of not being able to document due to the situation here. If, and there's a continuation, if it is possible, would you make a movie to show what we, the audience could not see? the message of the loss of water and change in environment seems very important. Um, I'm not sure I understand this question fully. Um, I also feel the frustration of not being able to document due to the situation there. If it's possible, would you make a movie to show what we, the audience, could not see? The message of the loss of water and change in environment seems very important. Oh, um, so you're talking specifically about not being able to film at the RLC. Um, and um, I mean, I don't think that I'm going to go back and make another film there. Also, I'm not sure that they've opened up in terms of, you know, like being able to film those infrastructures. Um, I think there there is a documentary that is about the RLC, um, but I think that part of the idea of not being able to, I think part of not being able to see document or document the seeing or the act of witnessing is actually an important component of you know what has happened there. Um, and also, you know, I mean, in some ways like speaks to um, the impact and also um, um, I think um, uh, kind of maybe describes it without showing this kind of, you know, what I've heard described as um, like disaster tourism, um, you know, like um, making something um, like kind of, um, just sensationalizing the pain or the destruction. Um, but I don't think I personally am going to go back and try to film there. Um, okay, so Natsuko continues. Um, if it's possible, would you make a movie to show? Okay, that was part of it. How can we read access the book you wrote? Okay, so, um, the book is published by Dancing Foxes Press. Um, it's a small art publisher in um, Brooklyn, New York. And um, you can go to their website and they have it there. Um, um, I think that they sell it maybe on uh, DAP. Um, and um, uh, if, you, um, if you contact me then, um, for instance, if you're a student, um, I can get you a copy. <laughs> um, okay. Oh, um, Argune, hi. Um, oh, okay, that wasn't a question, but hello. Um, can all the material in your lecture today, especially the quotes and references be found in the artist book? Um, the first part, yes, because it's the book. The second part with the exhibition, no, because um, they're not in the book. So I think there's three quotes. One is by Astrida Neimanis, and that's from Bodies of Water. Um, Ashley Consilo Willox, um, that's in um, uh, a book she edited. Um, um, oh my God, I'm totally blanking on it. Um, 
Morning Nature in her essay. And then um, Sandra, um, Sandra um, Steingrabers, it's um, her, her book on motherhood. So those are the three quotes you can find. Um, I don't know if there's any more questions. Um, if you have any, uh, you could, you're welcome to put them in the chat and I'll wait for another second and see if anyone has any other questions. Oh, and Claudia says that the Hammer Store Online has the book, I guess. Okay, well, um, thank you so much, everyone. I appreciate you listening to the talk and I um, uh, hope you have a good night.